I'm Andrew Hill, the FT's Management Editor. As a long-time observer of chief executives, I've always been interested in how leaders behave under pressure. Whether they're rescuing a company, bidding for another or being bid for, launching a new venture, or even facing disgrace, trial and jail. To run an organisation, you need somehow to be able to cope with intense stress. I went to interview four corporate leaders about how they managed, personally and professionally, in the toughest times. It was a defeat that in some respects was, was merciful, but at the time, yeah, it, it didn't feel great. I take things non-emotionally and I'm more analytical than emotional. How do you think you would feel if you had a child and everyone said to you, wow, your baby's really ugly? Dennis Kozlowski faced stress every day as chief executive of the enormous U.S. conglomerate Tyco in the 1990s. People tell CEOs that, that are on the top of the game what they want to hear. And then he went to jail. It's about as Kafkaesque as you can get. It's like a terrorist sitting there with a gun to your head. The Financial Times caught up with him at his New York apartment to explore how he dealt with that pressure and what he has learned. I guess it's true that some people get a shock, a minor shock. Instead, I got an earthquake. When we were growing up, you know, was, everybody was the same. It was the post-World War II. Uh, from World War II, I was part of the baby boomers. Now, my parents never owned a home. We lived in a six-family apartment building over in Newark, New Jersey. Fathers typically went to work at that time. Mothers didn't. Uh, and you, know, you lived on you know, whatever income the father had. From modest roots, Dennis Kozlowski, now 69, worked his way to the top of Tyco. The company produced everything from plastic bags to security systems, and Kozlowski ran it for 10 years. At his peak, he was one of the highest paid and most deal-driven CEOs in America. How intense were those 10 years as chief executive of the company? They're, they're, they were extremely intense. It was in the days before you could instantly communicate with somebody. There was a lot of unknown at that time too, especially in a company the size of of Tyco, we were doing business in 60 different countries. It was something that was never removed from your mind. You were always thinking about the company, no matter what else you may be doing. On the tennis court, if you're going for a run, uh, if you're selling a sailboat, whatever is going on, you were thinking about the company. Your, your mind was always going back there. He learned that the only way to run this vast organization, which employed more than a quarter of a million people, was to delegate. But that didn't lessen the pressure to meet targets and make deals. I think the most stressful thing was the acquisitions. Uh, and some of the acquisitions, uh, you can make or break the company. And you can go from having a lot of confidence in a company to, to no confidence you know, with one bad deal. Despite the stress, it was the deals that made his name and turned Tyco into a stock market favourite. With success came publicity. He made the cover of Business Week in 2001, which labelled him the most aggressive CEO and described him as supremely self-assured. How did you deal with, at the time, that publicity personally? Did it go to your head, do you feel? I, I think it had me believe some of my own press. You know, back then, when uh, you come out as being the number one company uh, in the S&P by an analysis that you know, some independent party does, you, know, you start believing you know, you're, you're pretty good. But I always knew it was an entire management team. The people running the operating divisions you know, were, were the stars of the show. But prosecutors and reporters would ultimately focus on the trappings of wealth he accumulated. The extravagant $2 million party for his now ex-wife's 40th birthday in 2001. Expensive decor, including a notorious $6,000 shower curtain. His mansions and yacht. And a lavish pay package aimed at keeping him at Tyco until at least 2008. Around that time, you were also offered and signed a pretty generous remuneration agreement plus lucrative severance terms. Sure. And this, of course, came to the heart of one view of what happened then yes. afterwards. But did that feel like it was something that was deserved for the work that you were putting in? Yeah, if you looked at our return to the shareholders for a lot of years, you know, we, were, we were doing a good job. Investors you know, were doing well, uh, employees were doing well. Uh, I was considering leaving Tyco. And my mind was made up. In fact, I had a couple of other opportunities where I felt I was at Tyco long enough, and uh, I sought some outrageous terms, 
you know, from the uh, uh, from the compensation committee to you know to stay uh, because I felt you know I could do some of the things that I was doing and take some of the public company pressure off myself. So when I sent the word out to the board that you know, here's a uh, compensation agreement and I modeled it after you know, other compensation high level compensation agreements out there to you know for uh, uh, for a stay put you know, uh, uh, situation uh, I, I I think I, I was surprised that that the board went along with it or that the compensation committee went along with it I I, I wouldn't have signed the other side right. of that then things started to go very wrong Following the fraudulent collapse of Enron, the US power company, in 2001, the climate for CEOs had chilled sharply. Kozlowski was an inviting target for prosecutors. Business worries built up. And in 2002, out of the blue, Kozlowski was indicted for not paying sales tax on art acquired for the Manhattan apartment he then used. The Tyco board forced him to stand down. Did you have a kind of queasy feeling that this might be the beginning of something much, much graver? Well, I had the feeling that... Uh... You know, I did nothing wrong, uh, and that I have to fight this. And uh, you know, doing what I needed to do was going to take away my ability to run a company, to, you know, to run a public company. It's a different kind of pressure, but it, it, it's all it's all very stressful. Uh, but you know, it was a different kind of pressure. You're in a comfort zone as a CEO. I I came up through the organization at Tyco, and I knew my way around. You now suddenly you are being faced with a uh, criminal uh, indictment. Uh, you know, I don't know anything about criminal lawyers or how the process works. What did it feel like being called and told that you were no longer CEO? Uh, it, you know, it, it, was, it was devastating. You know, certainly devastating, but it was, uh, uh, I, had, I had a bigger problem. I had, you know, I was going to be indicted on a criminal sales tax charge. Did you feel in the sense that any protection that you might have had from being the famous deal maker, Dennis Kozlowski, had been sort of stripped away at that point? It, it was an all-consuming, you know, 365, 24-7 job. But, you know, once I was out of, out of that job, you know, I, you know, I, you know, you know the CEO persona stayed there. And then I was, you know, here on this side being Dennis, you know, and, and looking at what I needed to do to, uh, uh, to defend myself. The sales tax charges were dropped, but the indictment set off a chain reaction. Kozlowski was accused of looting $100 million from the company in the form of bonuses that were not approved by the Tyco board. The uh, company, through independent counsel they hired, came up with the fact that uh, I stole bonuses that were... Uh, uh, that that were paid on four of the most profitable trans transactions ever in the history of Tyco, so that's what went wrong. That's factually what what happened. Right. But what did you feel had gone wrong between this lofty moment of being the Business Week cover and the, the publicity and the <clears throat> compensation committee saying we're happy to meet your extraordinary demands for the severance and so on? and the, the fall to the point where you're... Well, there was a sea change. The whole environment changed at that time. Uh, before Enron, CEOs were, uh, uh, were um, talked about on you know, media shows. Uh, uh, the stock market went up for <clears throat> throughout the 90s. The wind was at everybody's back. And then Enron came along, and CEOs became bad guys. We were all viewed with you know, a lot of skepticism. Defenders of the former CEO claim he was the victim of failed governance and overzealous prosecutors. But after two trials, the first a mistrial, Kozlowski served eight years in jail, the first six and a half in a prison that also housed murderers and drug dealers. Desperate for freedom, he told the parole board simple greed led to his downfall. I think when you go before a parole board uh, who can absolutely determine where you're going and what you're doing, uh, it's about as Kafkaesque as you can get. It's like a terrorist sitting there with a gun to your head and saying, unless you tell us what we need to hear or what we want to hear, you're, you're not going to get parole. So I, I, I think you, know, you, you have to think through 
you know, reality from, you know, from the situation that, you know, you're, you're dealing with, you know, with a, you know, with a parole board. And that might not necessarily be, you know, be exactly the same things. You know, I, I maintain that, you know, I was not you know, guilty of, of the things a jury found me guilty of. And I, you know, for the most part, I maintain that to this day. In jail, in contrast to his previous life, Kozlowski's goals were simple. For example, to have a chair to sit on. He became the jail's laundry czar. What I needed to do was to stay busy, you know, in some way. And you know, by having the laundry job, uh, I was able to sit in the laundry room and uh, uh, have a chair, which is a rare commodity in prison. It's right. the one I was in. And uh, so to have a, you know, a bit of small little wooden chair, but to have a chair, uh, be able to do my job in the washers and dryers and read at the same time. Only in 2015 was he finally free to travel without curfews, supervision or other obligations. Having repaid nearly $100 million, plus even more in fines and legal fees, he has embarked on a new life and married again. He does some low-profile corporate advisory work and chairs a non-profit that helps ex-prisoners re-enter society. Above all, he says he has restored the balance and time with family he sacrificed when CEO. I had this level of satisfaction and happiness at home I'm not certain, you know, I, I would have been the, you know, uh, using your words or media words, the aggressive CEO. Uh, you know, I, I might have been doing something totally different uh, and, and, and had achieved, you know, uh, you know, a level of real happiness uh, because making a lot of money or having, you know, having homes that, uh, that uh, others resent or, you know, or uh, feel that, you know, I've done too well in life. Uh, you know, is not going to make you happy. You felt you were happy at the time, though, presumably, yeah, circa I, I, 2001. Yeah, I, I, felt, you know, I felt everybody that was working for me, you know, staying at the homes I had or, you know, crewing a boat I had, I felt they were very happy. They were in the right place at the right time, enjoying, enjoying those things. Uh, I, I never, or hardly ever, you know, got to use it. I had a ski house that I got to maybe, maybe, you know, seven or eight days a year. I asked him, what would he change now? He refers back to his childhood as the root of his overriding desire to prove himself. You know, at the time I was growing up, I didn't know this, but I grew up extremely poor. Uh, you know, the attitude that I had something to prove in business that I could do as well as, as everybody else was something that, uh, that motivated me too. But uh, once, you know, once I achieved a certain level, you know, and I, and I proved it. I didn't need to go on proving it year after year after year. Might it be that you need somebody else to tell you that when you're at that stage? It's quite hard to perhaps, imagine in yeah, that situation. Perhaps if people tell CEOs that that are on the top of the game what they want to hear. Very few people tell them, you know, something contrarian for fear of, you know, of being uh, not listened to or you know not having any influence. So uh, I think if you know if somebody that uh, you know, got my attention with that, and I and I had that advice. It would have been helpful to me. It certainly would have been correct, but I think at that time it it could have been helpful. Right, yeah. and and I guess it's true that some people get a shock, a minor shock, earlier in their career. Sure, it could be a health issue, or it yeah. could be you know a, a family issue. You know, uh, but in, instead I got an earthquake. You know, instead of a shock. <laughs>